$35 a year for a membership. And we give you information like we're going to receive tonight from these three lovely gentlemen. And we also have a Kwanzaa party and we do, uh, we try to do a Lorraine Hansberry lecture series. So we, we work to keep our community informed and, and moving forward. Thank you very much, Linda. And I'm sure tonight's program. No. What she didn't say is we're looking for people under 50 because we have to prepare them to take our places. So we definitely need as many people as possible, you know, to pass it on. And as the elders, that's our job to pass the information on. So I just wanted to add that to it. Okay, at this point, we're going to interview our panelists for the conversation. And they're an uh, outstanding group. I think they, don't they look handsome? Ah, you do too, Arlene, but you look beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So first we have Scott Pennington. Scott's right here. He's a partner at Benning, Pen, Bennett and Pennington LLC, along with his wife, Christine, joining us today. His primary areas of practice are criminal defense, that's why he's here. Expungement, traffic matters, uh, DWIs, DUIs. His additional areas of practice are wills and trusts, family, education, and employment law. He has successfully defended individuals charged with criminal offenses, including homicide, sexual assault, extortion, prostitution, larceny, counterfeiting, drug matters, assaults with deadly weapons, and has defended literally hundreds of DWIs with an impressive dismissal acquittal streak of 24 DWIs in a short 24 month consecutive period. He has served on New Jersey Supreme Court Committee on Municipal Court Practice as well as the Local Attorney Ethics Committee. Scott has provided legal services to several entities including the City of Newark, East Orange, Bloomfield, Jersey City, Inglewood Public Schools and part of his criminal defense practice. He has served as a public defender in Orange, Irvington, Roselle uh, Municipal Court. Uh, I did want to tell you about his family. Um, so this is a good part. Recently, he served as the only male on a panel in Manhattan to address the issues of sexual harassment, I believe women, thanks to his wife. Scott has provided numerous seminars to the public, including a presentation on expungement, criminal records, which he provided to various churches and civic organizations. So this is Scott Pennington, and he's one of the two brothers, right? Oh. Now, yeah, so actually, I have three, three brothers, only one of uh, whom is not an attorney. Oh, Darryl, really? as you know, was yeah, he recently passed away. Yeah, Darryl still is, although he doesn't really practice anymore. He's, he's, he's an administrator, person. right? Yeah. Right, and actually, uh, Scott was kind enough to fill in for Darrell who unfortunately passed, and he was my go to person for this particular. And this is our third year, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done. The other one is uh, Kay Anthony Thomas. This is his first time actually seeing me. He's an assistant federal public defender at the Office of Federal Public Defender for the District of New Jersey. For over 20 years, Mr. Thomas has been a zealous advocate of persons charged federally with federal offenses. In his capacity, he handles his clients' matters from pre-indictment proceedings, which he'll talk about, uh, distinguishing from New York and also the um, Superior Court level handles his client matters from pre-indictment proceedings through appeals that are litigated before the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Mr. Thomas is also adjunct professor at his alma mater, Seton Hall University School of Law, the other law school, <laughs> where he teaches advanced criminal practice and persuasion and advocacy. He also teaches in the law school Summer Institute for Pre-Legal Studies. There he blends his trial skills with the courses he regularly teaches to ensure aspiring law students experience an engaging simulated law school experience. Mr. Thomas is also a volunteer coach for several of the law school's mock trial teams. He served 
several terms as a member of New Jersey Supreme Court Committee on Character, and he presently serves as on the Board of Trustees at Phillips Academy Charter School in New Jersey. And I just want to make sure I give you about his family. I know I saw something here, because I thought it said he had 18 kids, but he doesn't. Aside from his work and commitment to serving his community and helping others, Mr. Thomas's greatest accomplishment is being a father to his amazing children, Sasha 18 and Chase 15. I just love those names. Okay. The next person, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Narlene. Is that, is that okay? Mr. Schiff? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Narlene in the technology, currently works as an assistant prosecutor with the Gloucester County. That's why she's not here. She's way down in Gloucester County. Prosecutor's office is an assigned to the special victims unit. Oh, like law and order. Previously, she worked at, at the Mercer County Prosecutor's office for over five years. At different times, she was assigned to multiple units such as juvenile, domestic violence, detentions, and trial team. For over a year and a half, she worked as the chief of the drug court unit, now known as recovery court. She successfully argued before the New Jersey Supreme Court and currently serves in New Jersey Supreme Court Committee on Criminal Practice. As an assistant prosecutor, she believes that the community engagement by law enforcement is crucial to achieving justice. Therefore, she has engaged in community service activities such as ser serving food at the Trenton area soup kitchen, delivering meals through meals on wheels, and spoke to young students regarding what it means to be a prosecutor. In September 2019, she served as a panelist in expungement information program at Mercer County Community College that was attended by over 150 community members who were interested in expunging their records. She informed the attendees of the common mistakes that should be avoided in their petitions from a prosecutor's point of view. She is also a founding member of the Haitian American Lawyers, right? Without Haiti, there'd be no United States. <laughs> She's also a member of the Association of Black Women Lawyers in New Jersey and has served on its executive board since 2015. As four, as, after four years as treasurer, she's the incoming president for the 2023 term for the Association of Black Women Lawyers. Uh, she was admitted to the Bar in 2013, the New York Bar in 2017, and obtained her Juris Doctorate from that other law school, Seton Hall Law School. After graduating from law school, she clerked for the Honorable Janetta Marbury and the family part in the um, Mercer Vintage. And then not the least of all, but like my little brother, Commissioner Giles Howard Ship currently serves on New Jersey Police Training Commission. He was immediately assigned to the legislative committee due to his wealth of experience in policy development and the legislative process. In his role as commissioner, he is responsible for the development and certification of basic training for county and local police, sheriffs, sheriff officers, state and county investigators, state and county correction officers, juvenile detention officers, and a number of other law enforcement positions, as well as several instructor development courses. Moreover, PTC, otherwise known as Police Training Commission, developed operational guidelines to implement applicable training standards, monitor the operation of all PTC certified academies, review all training injuries, investigate possible violations of Police Training Act, or PTC, PTC rules occurring during authorized training courses and handled appeals involving the challenges to T, PTC's decisions regarding example trainee dismissals from PTC certified courses, training waivers and drug training practices. He's a principal and CEO of a public safety management firm, Homeland Global Strategies, L, Strategies LLC, and has recently completed an assignment for the United States Department of Justice Community Oriented Police Services and the Police Foundation. Uh, he's also a member of Noble uh, and has been for a while. He has so much stuff to do. Anyway, he's just a really important person. And he's here because he's going to talk about uh, how the police role, particularly with regard to our theme for the night. As I was about to say, um, first of all, give them all a hand. All right. As I said earlier, we've done this program, this is our third time. And this is really a tribute to the Central Park Five. Um, now we know as the exonerated five. Uh, the, the hope was that we would get information from this group that would help eliminate or reduce the possibility that anyone else would have the experience that their families and that these young men had. So that's really, you got it now? You're okay? Okay. So. 
Um, most of you that are in the room are probably old enough to remember the Central Park Five, maybe some of the people in the audience. I know I had talked to a lot of young people who may not necessarily know about it, but basically there were five black teens, one with Spanish speaking heritage, and they were accused of this thing called wilding. Uh, wilding's activity by a gang of youth going around on uh, public property, ravaging and, and supposedly violent in these public places, attacking people at random. So it was interesting because the police had interrogated them at night, late at night or early in the morning without their families, that was one. The other thing, if you may remember that um, former President Trump called for the reinstatement of the New York death penalty as a result of these, this, this fact pattern. Uh, the black community unfortunately bought into their guilt. You know, and that was sort of the sad part that we bought into it, which allowed them to be in a situation where they didn't necessarily have the support they had. However, WBAI Radio and the late Bob Slade from WBLS FM Open Line and KISS pursued the story to get the facts and the truth. Even though someone else admitted to the crime, because they were because they were black men, they must have committed a crime. So they uh, they should still be incarcerated. That was the feeling. They were black men, uh, young black men, and it didn't matter. Even though they knew that somebody else who came forth and said I did it, oh no, they must have done something. Keep them there anyway. So the prosecutor pursued the matter, knowing differently. She received eventually, as a result of her work and her efforts. She received offers from Hollywood to write for crime related programs and made a whole lot of money. Uh, the young men brought a lawsuit against the city of New York. And unfortunately, the mayor at the time, I think were two mayors that refused to authorize their compensation for the trauma they experienced for false imprisonment. Um, uh, when I said trauma, false arrests, all the falses that took place. Uh, they have attempted with some success to move on with their respective lives. But just to add, because I thought this was interesting, Emily Baxter, that you may or may not know, is a former Minnesota public defender, now created and director of a, a nonprofit called We Are All Criminals. And she did that just to let people know that if you've driven over 25 miles an hour in a 25 mile zone, you've committed a criminal infraction. And so her whole thing is, let me let people know that when you're dealing with people who are incarcerated, when you're dealing with people in the system from the beginning all the way through, whether you're a judge, correction officer, police officer, to keep in mind that but for, you could be on the other side and to hold on to that humanity, regardless of what the situation is. So one of the things she says, aside from the fact that we've all done something, everybody except for, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, her position from her research is that 75% of the people who actually have done something criminal, aside from infractions, 75% of them never get caught. On the other hand, 75% of the people who actually are prosecuted are only prosecuted and convicted because they didn't have the resources. So they serve time because they don't have resources. So I, and I thought that was important to um, you know, bring up. So on that note, I think we should go on and start the conversation. And I wanted to start the conversation with Mr. Pennington. And I really wanted him to kind of take us through the process and then what's gonna happen. Narlene is gonna add her part with regard from your vantage point as a prosecutor. And then Anthony will add from his point. And of course, Mr. Sh Commissioner Ship will actually talk about it from his vantage point. So Mr. Pennington. Oh, well, thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Carter so much for having me. And I want to thank my wife, Christina, for bringing me here today. Uh, this is, as, as Professor says, is a very important topic. Um, as she was, she was speaking, I reflected upon my experiences in various courtrooms all over. And uh, I'm thinking about the Central Park Five or the Exonerated Five. Uh, I do regard them all as, as young. One had a Spanish surname. That's important too. I was thinking some of the courts that I have I, I, uh, worked in. One in particular, I'm going to actually point out specific courts. There's a court, uh, I think it's Mount, that nine out of 10 of the people that banished her. I'm thinking nine out of 10 people. 
residents there? Do they have Spanish surnames? There's, there are a lot of expensive homes for people who don't look like us, don't have those kinds of names or anything. So I'm not saying that sitting down in the morning clock, oh, I see this black and brown man. But there is lots of prosecution. Mention 75% of the crimes uh, that are committed, you know, sometimes they go unsolved. And if they, uh, people aren't necessarily convicted and those are necessarily serve time, so I think the, the color is scrutinized a little bit different. Um, you know, I think it's more than a coincidence. I was involved in a committee that uh, racial profiling or driving, they kept modifying the name of the committee. The driving wall black committee to the walking wall black committee to the existing wall black committee, and uh, it's just very interesting. I'm not saying that the people who are arrested are perfect. I'm not saying that the police are all hideous and hateful. That's not true. They're human beings, and they have a job to do. What I want to try to do is focus more on prevention, because as we've all heard the saying a million times, the cure. Is the system, does it have a bit of a racism to it? Yeah, okay, it definitely does. But you know what I noticed every morning when I wake up and shave? I notice. I'm a black man, so I have to conduct myself accordingly. And I just impress that upon a young black men as well. I'm both of the Central Park Five kids, but so to avoid being in that situation. That's my personal experience. And I stranger to the cold pinch of uh, I've actually been stabbed uh, both times. The two common kids, uh, whatever you call them, factors involved in both incidents, in the wrong place at the wrong time. That makes sense. So what I say to young people is be in the right place, do the right thing. If you're in church, for example, chances that a police officer is going to come in and yank you out of pews and lock you up, you're having dinner with your family at home. It's pretty remote that someone's going to kick down your front door. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but it's, it's pretty remote. If uh, you're in school or something like that, more than likely, you're going to be safe. But you're probably not going to be suspected in the first place. That's the problem. A lot of people are not in the right place. I got stabbed. I was just hanging out. That's what I said for years. And people asked me, oh, you got stabbed? You stabbed? What were you doing? I was just out there with my friends, just out there, making myself a target. When I got uh, arrested, well, not technically arrested, I was apprehended by police. Persons where I fit the description. What was interesting is hard to tell now, but back in the old days, I had a pretty sizable afro. The person they were looking for, <laughs> he was shorter. He had a close cropped haircut. But he's a young black male in the vicinity. That was good enough for them. Now, I don't want to dominate the conversation to hopefully get the ball rolling in discussing this. Uh, I don't think, I wonder, where's Professor Carter? I want to ask if we're going to we intersperse this. Wait till the end. Okay, in that case, then I'm going to conclude my remarks for this moment. Hope to get some more. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, oh, the process. You know what? Right. I, I actually have to be able to see, and I can't see that. So what do you want to start from the back, the sally port, where they bring the arrestees in, or the front when you walk into it, looking for assistance? Okay, I'll be. Right. Well, right here, uh, in the front door right here, you have the lobby, 
in the event someone comes into uh, the lobby, um, One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, there we go. All right, in the front of the building here where you see number one, you have the lobby, the lobby of the police department. Generally, depending upon how large the municipality is, it may vary a little bit, but basically when you come into that lobby, it's a waiting area to be filed. Or if you have a question or if you have some other type of uh, reason to be in that building. They will determine at that part, if you come in, you might be coming in to speak to a detective about a reported crime. Then they would notify them. They will come meet you in that lobby and take you back to their respective area. Uh, also too, if you had a complaint, they may bring an officer out to take the complaint from you or take it through the window, depending upon what type of complaint it is. And uh, additionally, um, if you go beyond that area, uh, as you see in, let's see, number three, the officer's uh, desk may be there, uh, lieutenant's office. Lieutenant is generally, in the evening hours, what's called a watch commander. They generally are uh, substituting for the chief of police, so they're in charge of the entire building at that time. Uh, you go to the precinct captains generally, and as I said, this will vary depending on the size of your municipality. The precinct captain could be uh, the watch commander or the chief during that time as well. Uh, firing range, I don't know exactly how far we want to go into that, but in this particular building, they have a firing range, which all officers have to go to twice a year to qualify in. They have to qualify twice a year with a proficiency of 80% or better. Um, the armory is where they keep all the ammunition and the weapons. Jail guard desk. Generally, when people are in a uh, in the jail cell, they have to be monitored 24/7. So they may have, and as I said again, this varies depending upon how large the municipality is. They may have an officer assigned to that unit, or in smaller agencies, they may have a television monitor monitoring the individuals there. And every 30 minutes, you have to fill out a report and it's called a a, shell, a cell check sheet. You move further, you see the drunk tank there. That's where they would bring people in to do a second sobriety test. Generally, you'll give them a horizontal uh, stagnant gaze test out on the roadway to indicate if they probably under the under a substance, uh, being alcohol or drugs or prescription medication as well. If you're under that substance, they'll give you a basic test outside, but they'll bring you inside where they can record it and also have you in a controlled environment. So there's not a crack in the roadway or something like that. You can say, that's the reason why you didn't walk properly. Um, okay, uh, I guess that, uh, is that as far as we wanna go with that? Yeah, uh, I do wanna Adam? comment if I may. Um, I'm glad the commissionership took that because of course I'm not a police officer. I did go to police academy in the Air Force, long story. But, um, and Christina will tell you, sometimes even in the middle of the night, somehow, Clients get my home cell phone number and they'll call me two o'clock in the morning. I'm in the jail. I'm arrested. The truth is, as a criminal defense attorney, there's not a heck of a lot that I can do initially because as attorneys, we're not allowed to post your bail. All right. Uh, and generally, we're going to do everything that we can once for uh, court for, you know, especially into the new bail reform um, provision and the opportunity to go before a judge. And the judge determines two things, whether you are A, a flight risk, and B, a danger to society. And I have to argue that for them. But that's probably, in a lot of cases, that's the first time I get involved. So don't call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. There's not a heck of a lot I can do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, most of it. Yeah, I mean, I went right to the jail cells. And, uh, and generally, I didn't talk about the interrogation room, but... That's the key part with the, with the five. Now, in the event that you come in, generally, if you go into the interrogation room, if it's not a crime that has already been committed, if you've been placed under arrest, they will bring you into the rear of the building, which is someplace called a sally port, and they will walk you up to, well, first they will bring you in and, uh, 
give, they may give you some minor questions outside, but they will bring you into uh, either an interrogation room or to a detective's desk. And they will question you, or the patrolman may even question you about the particular uh, incident that occurred. I don't want to call it a crime yet because we can't classify that until you do step A, B, and C. And the lawyers can talk about that a little bit more. Um, but they'll bring you in and they will talk to you. And until you will be also, if there's probable cause to believe you have committed the crime, we will process you. By processing you, I mean fingerprint you, uh, take a photo of you, and uh, take all of your property uh, from you and put you in a jail cell. Most smaller jails like to hold people too long. So uh, what will happen then after the detectives have talked to you, the interrogation room. Uh, now, this will vary depending upon your age. If you are a juvenile, your parent, your parent has the right to be with you, all right? Uh, but if you're adult, generally they'll bring you in and they will uh, ask you questions about the incident occurred. And if they feel they have enough, the probable cause to charge you with a crime, you'll be charged with a crime. The, uh, the judge will be notified, bail will be set. And if you can make bail, uh, someone can come down to the headquarters and post bail. If not, you will be sent out to a county jail. That I'm generalizing, um, uh, basically, but that's generally the process. Thank you. And now we're going to have Scott go through the flow chart. Okay, the flow chart. This uh, is out to be able to see over there. Huh? Yeah. Maybe should I stand up? Uh... Whatever makes you comfortable. There it is right there. I'm going to take my microphone with me. Yeah, good idea. All right. Okay, let me read this, check, check, test my reading skills. Okay, so as commissioner said, you have the arrest process and you have the booking and the first appearance. Let's talk about that first. I mentioned earlier, and there's, under certain circumstances, you may not get arrested in the first place. Very, very quick story, I won't bend you here too long, but there were these shoplifters I knew. Oh, I was impressed by their shoplifting skills. <laughs> no, seriously, this is what they did, they were a team. One of them was a white guy, the other was a black guy. So the white guy would be in this corner of the store, robbing them blind. The black guy was way over in that corner of the store, just looking at price tags, looking at sizes of shirts and everything. Every single camera, every single security person in the store was staring at him while his partner is ripping him off blind. So what they decided to do, this is, this is the, the real funny part though, is later on. They felt they were such great thieves that guess what they decided to do? promote themselves to car theft. They didn't have any skills in car theft. They went up to Roseland and tried to steal a car and got caught. So the interesting thing was they were still kind of young, maybe 18, 19 years old. And the police officers um, said to the white guy, give me your parents' phone number. And he said, why? He said, so we can call them, they can take your butt home or else I'll have to arrest you. They didn't succeed in stealing the car, they got caught trying. The black guy said, oh, okay, can I give you my parents' number? He said, oh, no, 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 you're going down to Essex County Jail. Story. So anyway, we talk about the arrest. The arrest can occur and sometimes under flaky uh, you know, circumstances. You have the booking process. They have to record everything that happens. That's the booking process. They can't just do it. And uh, I don't know what this TV shows indicate. <laughs> but between the booking and the first appearance, and this is something that I want to elaborate on that the commissioner was mentioning. If you get taken in for booking, the intention is to arrest you to charge you, that's what the intention is. So if somebody says to, and particularly speaking to the younger people, if somebody says, I just want you to come down, we just wanna have a conversation with you, not a big deal, and try to make friends with you. No, they're trying to arrest you. And remember, you have a fifth and sixth amendment right to A, remain silent, as my wife often says to her clients, you have the right to remain silent. You see that on TV and movies all the time, right? So then shut the blank up, okay. Sorry about that. Yes, she does. You do say that. <laughs> and uh, the thing about the parents being present with juveniles, yes, the parent, just as the adults and, and the kids too are entitled to counsel before the question, and they can invoke that right, and the questioning is going to cease at that time, other than basic information like who are you, where you live, and that kind of thing. Um, the thing about parents is we need to talk to the parents now. If you do have to go down, I don't know if this happened exactly this way in this, the uh, exonerated five people or not, but I remember assisting Christina, my wife, with a case she was representing with a juvenile. I'm trying to remember, it was a gun case or something, somewhere in the southern part of the state, 
And I looked at the videotape where the mother was present and the son was being uh, interviewed, if you will. The mother was throwing him right under the bus, if I'm right. I think she was saying something like, uh, she pretty much admitted that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. And I wish he had just shut up. He would have been better off without her even being present. But I'm not sug suggesting that people talk when their parents aren't present. No, go for it right. And very, very quickly before I move on to the flow chart, one of my favorite cases, I'm not going to mention his name, I never do, but I had this client, oh, it was a beautiful, beautiful interrogation. I demanded the videotapes of the interrogation, and normally our clients stick their feet in their mouths, and uh, you can't say the right thing, you can't say the wrong thing, don't say anything. And guess what he said? They said to him, young man, we have you on videotape. We know you were in the area, you were in the exact same clothes of the suspected person. You know what he said? He said, Sir, may I please call my father and my attorney? Harder. Yeah, well, we know it was you. We have witnesses who saw you there. Now what do you have to say? He said, sir, may I please, please call my father and my attorney? He just kept saying that like a parrot. Ultimately, I'm not going to, you know, I wasn't there. I can't say for sure. I believe he did what they accused him of, but guess what? I got him off. I got completely dismissed. So anyway, that we have the first appearances where we go in to... Uh, have the person read the charges to them. This is what you're charged with. These are the potential penalties. And I always tell people what the worst case scenario penalties are. I don't tell them that, no, this is the, the lightest thing that may happen. I tell them what's the worst thing that can happen. Judges also often give them the whole range. And then they ask them, ultimately, this is kind of funny. They often ask them, knowing this information, how do you plead, guilty or not guilty? It's a quick answer. The answer is either one thing, guilty or not guilty. But they start talking about their grandmother's favorite peach pie recipe and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so have your lawyer with you to guide you. Don't talk too much. Don't get on people's nerves. Are you guilty or not guilty? That's what the first appearance is for. Um, and also, if it's in, in superior court, they have what's called the CJP, criminal judicial processing, where that judge is really there to rubber stamp your case. Like I said, process you into the court system and then determine whether your case is going to go up to Superior Court for, for possible indictment, or they might remand it down to Municipal Court. They're not going to dismiss it at that level. They're not going to do much else other than rubber stamp it up, rubber stamp it down. Uh, once we do that, we have the right, okay, we're going in this direction. The arraignment would come in Superior Court on the state level once a person has been uh, indicted by a grand jury. They get together. It's very one-sided. They get to decide whether there's sufficient evidence to formally charge you with the offense police officers arrested you for. If a grand jury, a jury of your peers have decided that there's enough, they put the stamp on there, so to speak, which is the indictment, back before the superior court. And uh, then you start, well, like I said, the formal charges are, are, are made as a result of the um, indictment. At that point, that is when your defense attorney can get what's called discovery. That's why people all the time got to be represented by counsel. Because first of all, a lot of people don't even realize that they have a right to discovery. They don't even know what discovery is. Discovery is the evidence that the, the state intends to use against you at trial. And not, they can't you know, back. Aha, I got you. You may see that on TV and in movies, but that's not how it happens in real life. We get a chance to go over that discovery very, very, very carefully. If there are any inconsistencies, what I like to do with discovery is always do a timeline. The time of day and the location of where the person was arrested, when they were brought into the police department, when they were tested, like you mentioned earlier about the DWIs and things like that. That's all very important because with the DWI, one little thing, just to give you a quick example, in order for the breath test to be considered valid, one of the things that has to happen is that a police officer or a series of police officers have to observe your mouth for 20 minutes straight to make sure if there's any residual alcohol in your mouth that it gets to evaporate and dissipate before they test you because they're supposed to be testing the alcohol in your lungs, in your lung air. But if there's alcohol still in your mouth and you blow into a machine, you might be spitting in actual raw alcohol into the machine. Let's say that you could have blown in a 0 0.5 level of alcohol. I'm not a mathematician, so I don't get too far into numbers, but I will say this. If a drop of alcohol comes from your mouth into the machine, it might read a, a 0.25, five times higher or something, which is not really valid. But the law says that if they wait 20 minutes 
for that update, that was sufficient. And the machine reading then might be acceptable. There's a lot to it, so I don't want to get too deep into all that. Um, we got discovery. Early resolution, early resolution, bottom line is, and this is something I try to avoid, early resolution is you pleading to something. The, the problem with that is, is that a lot of people are intimidated into pleading uh, to things and thinking, well, I've had clients even say to me, um, the, the prosecutor offered whatever, whatever, but not jail, I'll take it. I said, whoa, slow down a second. If you didn't really do it, as your attorney, I can't tell you to plead guilty to something you didn't do. Yeah, but I got to get back to work, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I just don't want to go to jail. The problem with that is, is once you take that plea, it may affect your employment rights, and if you ever get arrested again, oh, trust me, we're going to look at your record and see, oh, yeah, back in 2022, you pledged something. It wasn't really serious, but it's something, and it bolsters their argument for you know, tougher sentencing later on down the road. So early resolution, unlikely, unless we know that the evidence is so strong that fighting it is not in your best interest and that taking the deal is really, really something that you should do, then hey, I'd concede and go ahead and get my clients. Um, those are the press. Those are the press. I filed some of those. And it's kind of funny that um, I used to think that, that they would not be taken seriously, but they often are. Uh, but I've had situations where police officers, all right, case in point, had a case where a guy had, they found a gun in a guy's car. The thing about it is, is that they stopped him, they suspected him for being drunk driving. And under a specific law called State versus Wit, State versus Wit says that once a police officer arrests you for DWI, they do have a right to go and search your car for the source of the intoxicant. So if they suspect you of drinking and driving, what are they going to be looking for? Alcohol, exactly. And the alcohol obviously comes in the form of a bottle or a cup or something like that. And I can actually see on the body worn camera that they went in the center console, they found a bottle. I'm like, okay, as far as I'm concerned, they've satisfied or they've exhausted their ability to search, in my opinion. That's my argument. But no, they decided to keep on looking and they found a gun in a bag. So my argument was no, 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 no. The state be wit says you can find the source of the intoxicant, and they found the source of the intoxicant unless they get one, the person's consent to search, and I'm talking about informed consent. Two, a search warrant authorized by a, a, a judge or exigent circumstances or plain view, something like that. They had no reason to search further. So I fought that, got the, uh, you know, everything suppressed, not the, not the alcohol part, because uh, it was wrong. <laughs> But it's important to understand there, you can actually have motions and a motion is simply a request for the court to consider an argument to keep something out. Let's put motion to suppress. So that's what happened there. Uh, let's see, where are we now? Pre-trial hearing, these things can go on and on and on. I have some cases that last for a couple of years and clients get, they get um, restless and wanna know, when is this gonna be over? When is this gonna be over? You know what I do? I actually say to them very sharply, we can get this over with today. They say, really, how? I said, hey, let's go before the judge and say I'm guilty, okay? And they're like, I don't want to do that. I'm like, well, just shut up, okay? Let me, get, let me do my job. So, which I, I'm getting the, the, the uh, cue to do my job right now, finish up here. <laughs> so, of course, you have a hearing to discuss a resolution before the trial, discuss uh, discovery and everything. And again, the plea deal, if you accept what the prosecutor says, you know, offers you, that's where you're wrapping things up with the plea deal. Um, depositions, depositions in criminal don't happen quite as much as they happen with uh, civil cases. But a deposition could be used if a particular witness is like out of the country or in the hospital or something, or really cannot come to court, you can interview them ahead of time and their testimony in that interview can be used at trial. It goes a little deeper than that, but that's generally how it goes. And then if things don't work out, you have an actual trial. I pride myself on being, guess what, a litigator, and I'm not really a trial attorney. You know why? Oh, I have trials, but I think that if I do my job right, I can wrap things up pre-trial and get, I get most of my charges dismissed before you go to trial. Uh, if you go to trial, or even if you don't go to trial, if you take a plea or go to trial, there will be sentencing. I ask people all the time, do you have a criminal record? They say, nope. 
don't have no, no criminal record. I have not been convicted. And then you talk a little bit later and you find out, well, they got a fine. I'm like, you got a fine? You can only get a fine if you were found guilty of something. That's part of your sentence. That's what sentencing is. Sentencing could be getting put in jail. It could be fine. It could be probation. It could be a bunch of things. Whew. All right, that was a mouthful. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're going, to, we're going to have Narlene is going to come back and she's going to speak to the process regarding from the vantage point of being a prosecutor as soon as they bring her up. She should be on a minute. And then we'll have Anthony. Well, Narlene, you talk about it in response to what Mr. Pennington said uh, to give us the vantage point of a prosecutor with regard to the process. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, I will talk about the process from the prosecutor's vantage point. And as you know, uh, a prosecutor has a lot of discretion and that discretion starts from the very beginning at the time of arrest, pretty much after an arrest is made. And um, we do have uh, periods of time where we share the duties of being on call. And during that period of time, as prosecutors, we get phone calls uh, throughout the night, sometimes like two, three in the morning, if there's a DUI with a crash or, or there's an incident of domestic violence or there's a report of sexual assault, we do have prosecutors who are on call who get those calls and the police officers would call us regarding charging, um, uh, regarding uh, um, uh, what offenses to charge the, uh, the person who's arrested with. So that is where it starts. Um, and also they may call us to decide whether someone goes on, the charges go on a warrant or a summons. A summons, you are not arrested, you are not, take, you are not booked, taken in, um, you are given a new court date, or, uh, uh, you are given a court date to come to court at a later time. But if it's placed on a warrant, you are charged. Uh, you, uh, you are taken into um, custody. Now in New Jersey, we used to have a uh, bail. We, uh, now we don't have that anymore. Uh, for the most part, we have bail reform. So I'm briefly gonna explain what bail reform is because a lot of people, they come to court and they say, well, what's my bail, what's my bail? And it's like, no, there's no longer uh, 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 bail in New Jersey starting in 2017. Now, when some someone is arrested and placed on a warrant, they are actually processed and they go through um, CJP, which is the uh, central judiciary process um, that uh, Mr. Pennington referenced. And at that point, um, the case is, if that is the first time the person appears before a judge. At that point, the state will make a determination as to whether they will file for detention for that person. And uh, the detention is predicated on, um, on pretty much three parts, um, three um, really, there are one of three things that the state needs to show rather. One, that that person is not like, is a danger to a person in the community. Two, that person is not likely to appear in court as required. Or three, that that person uh, would obstruct the criminal justice system. So these are the three things that uh, that the court will look at, and there's a there's a whole formula. There's a um, there's a recommendation that is made uh, through the PSA um, um, prior to uh, prior to the state really assessing the case. The state doesn't have to go by the PSA. The court doesn't have to go by the PSA. But once the state files for detention on someone. Um, that person um, is not going to be released, is not gonna, going to be given a court date. The next time that person comes to court, it will be to appear before a judge so that the judge can make a determination as to whether that person should be held or released and on what conditions that person should be released. And um, that's, that will be based on arguments of counsel. So um, that's, that's the difference now. It's very rare that we have cash bail um, now in New Jersey. If the offense and uh, this detention process that I just um, described, and I hope I'm not, um, I didn't confuse anyone too much, um, it happens for crimes that occurred 
after um, uh, after um, January 1st, I, I would say at January, uh, January 1st, 2017. If an offense was committed prior to that, the old bail system will um, apply. Now, um, so, and again, I mentioned the prosec prosecutorial um, discretion at that point. At that point, the state can make a determination to downgrade cases as opposed to keep them in superior court, downgrade them to municipal court, or even right then and there. And I've, 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 I've done that, especially in contempt cases, someone could be charged with a fourth degree contempt case, but right at the process, the CJP process or the detention process, I would downgrade, I would evaluate the case, see what is the more appropriate uh, degree and downgrade the case to uh, the solely person's offense. So these are all of the, um, that these, these are some of the powers that the prosecutors have. Um, and um, after, after you go through the CJP process, the case can either go to pre-indictment conference where the case, the case is not, the, where the state tries to resolve the case prior to the matter going to the grand jury or it is sent to the grand jury. And um, yes, the grand jury is a one-sided process. Um, the defendant is not present. Testimony is not taken from the defendant. Defense counsel is not present. Pretty much the state is bringing the case in front of the people, um, a panel of 23 people and asking, and asking them to evaluate if there's enough probable cause, which is a well-grounded suspicion that the crime was committed and that the person committed the crime. So at that point, Guilt or innocence is not being evaluated. Um, it's just uh, whether there was a, whether what is described is a crime based on the statute, and whether the person who is arrested for that crime or charged with that crime is a person who is like likely committed that crime. If the grand jury indict, the case moves on. If the grand jury does not indict, the case is dead. Um, that's it. Um, in, um, and at that point, the state is obligated to present any Brady slash Giglio material to the grand jury. What that means is although the state has um, discretion, uh, the, prosecution, the prosecutor has power as to um, charging um, with crimes, the prosecutor also has the responsibility to present um, evidence that could exonerate that that could uh, that, that likely would exonerate the defendant. So if there is testimony, or if uh, well, I wouldn't say testimony per se at this point, but if there is um, someone else who made a, who told the police, yeah, this is I saw a completely different person. Um, somebody pro provided a statement that said I saw a completely different person. It wasn't the defendant. At that point, the prosecution is obligated to present that to the grand jury for the grand jury to evaluate the whole case. Because if that is not done, um, um, that that and uh, there's later a conviction. The conviction can very well be overturned. Um, so, and I will move forward to the arraignment process. The arraignment process is when the defendant. Um, uh, appears in court again after after um, uh, the grand jury uh, 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 indicted the case, and that's when the defendant is formally charged. At that point, you know exactly what the charges are, uh, because the state at that point has done more uh, additional investigation. Um, there is more; the, the state has more complete discovery. Um, and more than likely at that point too, the state will make a plea offer to try to resolve the case. And as Mr. Pennington said, if his client, um, if the offer that the, the state makes um, in, uh, on his end, the offer that his, the state makes um, doesn't in, involve prison time, he would not counsel his client to plead just because the client is not going to go to prison when the client is adamant that he or she did not commit the crime. Um, after, after that, you go into motion practice. It takes a very long time. Again, there are, most, there are a multitude of motions that either the defense or the state can, um, 
can file when there are multiple co-defendants cases, uh, they can be, become even more complicated. Um, then after motion practice, the case goes to trial, then it is uh, essentially um, after that, I, there will be a verdict, either guilty or not guilty, then there, it's not, the case is not done at uh, once it, um, there was a verdict. You have uh, motions and appeals that continue after that. So um, I just wanted to explain briefly what the prosecutors, uh, put, uh, what the prosecutor does um, when they're, um, um, uh, when there's an arrest. And I will also note that in New Jersey, when someone is detained, they are put on the clock, which is the speedy trial uh, clock. Uh, the prosecutor has 90 days from the day of arrest to indict the case. That means to present the case to the uh, grand jury. If that is not done and there is no reason, valid reason why that was not done, any reason that could be attributed to the defense why that is not done, the person can also be released. So that is something the defend, the state has to keep in mind what the clock is, what the timing, timing is once the defendant is detained. And there's also a specific timing to go by after indictment, um, et cetera. So essentially once someone is detained within two years, they should have a trial date. The matter should be tried. Well, thank you, Narlene. That's been very helpful. So now we're going to have Anthony Thomas talk about this from a federal point of view, particularly in his capacity as a public defender on the federal level. So, Mr. Thomas. Thank you very, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Hopefully, uh, I get a, well, after you hear my responses, hopefully I get a second invite. Uh, you will. <laughs> uh, like Scott, um, if I could have a little bit of privilege. I, I would like to thank Christine for, I can't say what my wife, but Scott's <laughs> wife for bringing me here today. Uh, Christine and I were classmates at Seton Hall Law School and the other, the other law school. school. <laughs> Seton Hall Law School and the Seton Hall Law School and remain friends um, uh, then um, and now. Uh, I, I will get to the, the federal response to this, but you know, I'm sitting here and it's, you know, probably 45 minutes after we start. I, I feel like an athlete in the waiting room being drafted. And it's like, are they gonna call my number? And <laughs> I speak and it's like, finally, I get to, I get to speak. Um, so, and, and the last comment is, is that, you know, these two put me here because I have a bow tie. And initially what I wanted to wear was a favorite t-shirt of mine. Uh, it's a t-shirt that has 410 U period S period 113 1973. And on the back of the t shirt, it states her right to choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to wear that, but I felt like I might have been overdressed, but I think it's probably in hindsight, it probably would have been appropriate. And that site is, is uh, Roe versus, Ro versus Wade, and we know what happened to Roe versus Wade. Uh, my federal response to this is, and, and I have to, I have to add this, this disclaimer, uh, all right? Uh, the, the, the opinions expressed by me are my own and not the reflection of the opinions of the Office of the Federal Public Defender. So as a general matter, um, as the flowchart indicated, it's, everything is pretty much the same, but unfortunately in the federal system, as soon as the person is arrested, uh, they are brought to court for what's called their initial appearance. It's just like, you know, your first appearance in state court, but in federal court, we call it an initial appearance where they have to be brought to a magistrate, whether it's a, an initial crime or whether it's a violation of supervised release. And during that initial appearance, the individual is informed of his or her rights. Uh, they are appointed counsel, and we explore the, the, the bail, whether that person can be released. Just like in a state system, the, the two prongs that the, the federal judges look for is number one, whether you're a risk of flight or whether you're a danger to the community. As an assistant federal public defender, we are appointed to represent individuals who lack the financial resources. And it still boggles my mind after 24 years of doing this, 
how prosecutors or assistant U.S. attorneys could stand up and say that my client is a flight risk. I was like, well, where is he going to fly, fly to from Newark to East Orange? It's like, that's not really a typical flight risk, right? So the majority of the times our arguments are basically with whether our clients are a danger to the community. And, you know, there's a fair argument that the United States attorney or assistant United States attorneys um, frequently use is because the penalty in federal court are exponentially worse than in state. And that's why they bring them over to federal court because they know that the penalties are what they are. And the majority of times our clients do have a lengthy criminal history and it makes it difficult for us to argue that our client is not a danger to the community. You know, we are successful with regards to release, uh, get, having our clients released, but it's, you know, the burden is, is, is not as severe as, you know, clear and convincing. Usually it's by preponderance of the evidence. And sometimes our clients are um, successful in getting released and released on conditions which could be onerous, but at the end of the day, our clients are able to continue to work, continue to provide for their family, continue to care for their loved ones. Uh, as it relates to what happens after initial appearance, the majority of the time our clients come in on what's called a criminal complaint. The criminal complaint technically expires after 30 days, but just on continuance, it just continues to renew. And the reason why the, the majority of our clients or individuals in the federal system agree to a continuance is that we try to see what discovery we can obtain. Discovery in federal court, if you close your eyes, that's the discovery you get. Um, it's very limited. And unlike in state court where the discovery, you know, it's an open, or I've heard, it's, a, oh, I've never practiced criminal law in, in state. But what I've heard is that it's a, your, the prosecutor's files are open. It's not the same in federal court. Technically, we are not allowed to know in advance a witness statement until that witness has testified and it's time for us to cross-examine that witness. Let me let that sink in for a second. A witness testifies and at that juncture, after that witness has testified, that's when we are supposed to get information on that witness. So most federal judges are not going to say, hey, we're going to you know, allow a defense attorney. It's like, well, we need time to review the giggly or jinx on this particular witness. The federal judges usually allow perhaps maybe the weekend before trial for that information to be turned over so we could have ample opportunity to cross-examine that witness, whether it's, well, usually the witnesses are adverse to our client's interests. Uh, so the discovery process, again, it's it's... Yes, there's discovery exists in federal court and it's usually just about everything with regards to our client's criminal history or lack of criminal history and whatever reports, uh, FBI reports, which is called 302s, are heavily redacted just so we could get a gist of what our clients, um, any statements our client made and what they have been accused of. And I, I'm going to go off topic because, you, you know, this all centers around the Central Park five or exonerated Central Park five. And I'm gonna look directly in this camera and as a federal and as assistant federal public defender, you know, I've had cases that, you know, you scratch your head and, and you know, my client has been convicted. Uh, I'll use my client's last name and not his first name. Mr. Fulton, I believe, and I'll go to the grave with this and I'll swear my mother's grave that uh, he's a client that probably uh, was innocent. And I'm going to look in the camera and, and mention the person who I believe committed this bank robbery, I believe on May 25th, 2012. Ricardo Barnes. And the reason why I say that is I want Ricardo Barnes to come after me for slander. I want him to sue me. So it will be by suing me, I think Mr. Fulton, Mr. Fulton would be vindicated. Uh, unfortunately, the jury did not believe our defense. Mr. Fulton was sentenced federally to 141 months. So if you ever 
you want to know the distinction between federal and state? You know, when you hear months, it's usually federal. Uh, Mr. Fulton was sentenced to 144 months. So quick math, that's 11.75 uh, uh, years. And, you know, Mr. Fulton saw this flyer today and I, and I, I thought he was going to come and I told him what it was about. And it, I'm sad that he's, he's not here because the last time I saw him was when he was sentenced. Uh, so I'm hoping that this gets broadcast and Mr. Ricardo Barnes does try to sue me civilly. Probably not gonna get much. I'm an assistant federal public defender. We don't make much. So good luck with trying to get some money out of me. But um, so, so that's pretty much what uh, the major distinction is with regards to state versus federal. I mean, I could go on and on, but- You're I'm a lawyer. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are paying me by the words, right? <laughs> not me, anyway. Um, I really appreciate everything you all said, and I really want to, you know, we're kind of staying on time, but what I want to do is have each of you address what you think the public can do to, or how they can contribute to reducing the possibility for families and individuals to suffer what the Central Park Five, now exonerated five, have gone through. So I guess I'll start with you, Mr. Thomas, and I'll go backwards, and then Narlene and then Mr. Ship, Commissioner, and then Mr. Pennington. I, I think for, for those that are live here, you are doing the right thing. You're, you're here and you're being educated on the system. Uh, the system is tough. Uh, it, you know, it's sort of like a net where it catches uh, the majority of people of color you know, the Central Park Five or what I would like to call, you know, rob of their youth because that's pretty much who they are. And if you use that title of being robbed of the youth, that's the majority of black men that's um, presently incarcerated. Uh, what we can do as a community is, is to continue to educate ourselves and to be aware, uh, whether it's the, from the simplest thing as downloading a podcast. I would recommend to all of you a, a podcast, which is probably what I have used for the last three years as a teaching tool. It is a podcast that's entitled In the Dark, season two. Uh, not In the Dark on Netflix, because that's about drug dealing. Uh, In the Dark, season two. It is the Curtis Giovanni Flowers um, story. He is an individual that was tried six times in Wyona, Mississippi. Uh, eventually in 2019, Judge Brett Kavanaugh wrote the majority opinion that uh, pretty much released Mr. Flowers from death row, which he's been on for, I think, 26 years. Uh, so one of the ways that I think the public can continue to be involved is to be educated. You don't have to sit, I mean, I'm not trying to take away anything from the North Public Library. And as I- Of course sitting, not. <laughs> as I was sitting here, I'm thinking, it's like, when was the last time I was in a public library? I've been in a lot of law libraries, not the other law school law library, of course. But, um, you know, I spend most of my time in law libraries. But podcasts, it's very simple. It's easy to listen to, you know, and each podcast advertise another podcast that's going to be interesting, right? So whether it's the, again, I'm going to keep plugging season two in the dark season two they can watch it from the public library and you could watch it from the public library or listen to it from the public library um and, and there's also there's there's a lot so that that's one way that I, I believe you know a passive way that i think we could all get involved is to continue to educate ourselves thank you narlene um uh, i will um echo what uh Mr. Thomas said, education uh, first and foremost um, is very important. And um, as you know, prosecutors have a lot of discretion. Um, the although the prosecutor um, himself or herself may not be directly involved with cases, but there are assistant prosecutors, which is what my title is, who are actually the ones going to court and charging cases and I very rarely, I have, um, as a line prosecutor, and I've been a prosecutor for six years now, 
I very rarely have a conversation with the prosecutor in my, in my office. I do have a lot of discretion myself. So I would also advise you to get to know, go do, just do a Google search. Who's the prosecutor in this or that county? Um, and get keep an eye and listen to what type of cases are being, um, are being um, look, read the papers and find out what is going on in your county. And I would say one thing that I find works well um, um, and um, is pressure. <laughs> um, and I will, I'm saying this as a, uh, as a prosecutor and um, prosecutor's number one job is to ensure that justice is done. It is not about convictions. And um, it is very unfortunate when a prosecutor gets so cut up that what they are so, they are primarily concerned about is how many convictions, getting really like, getting, trying to get as much blood as possible, which is, which is, which is not how justice is done. So when I say pressure, public pressure, we can see instances where public pressure really did um, um, sway, well, kept prosecutors accountable. Um, and, uh, and also pr public pressure can be the cause why prosecutors very zealously pursue cases when they shouldn't have. So an example of that with the exonerated five, there was the racial tensions that were happening um, around that time in New York um, where, and you have this white woman who is um, assaulted and left for dead uh, in the park. They wanted a conviction. And with that, um, there were a lot of mistakes that were made. And these five, um, boys, these five children were wrongly convicted. And um, as Linda mentioned earlier, um, uh, former President Donald Trump, he took, uh, he took out an ad asking that the death penalty re be reinstated. So that is the neg negative effect of public pressure. But um, the prosecutors should have held on to their oath to ensure that justice is done as opposed to uh, as opposed to just trying to obtain convictions. And we see the positive aspect of public pressure, which is uh, with the, uh, with the um, case of uh, Derek Chauvin, the, the police officer who murdered George Floyd. There was public pressure for him to be arrested. There was public pressure for him to be prosecuted. So you can, and, and again, the case of Ahmaud Aubrey, um, when this incident occurred, no one heard about it. The case went, be, went before multiple prosecutors who the, determined that there was no crime there. It wasn't until there was the, the tape was released by one of the defense attorneys and there was public pressure that, uh, that, um, that, uh, he was um, that uh, the, uh, the the men who murdered him were arrested and prosecuted and tried and eventually um, convicted. So um, again, without the education, without knowing how the process works, without knowing um, uh, the rights that a defendant has, the right that everyone has rather, everyone has those rights, not a defendant, everyone without knowing that, it, you will not be able to apply that pressure and you have to be active in your community because at the end of the day, prosecutors are accountable to the people. And um, I say this very often, being accountable to the people also means being accountable to that defendant uh, that I am prosecuting and making sure that his or her rights are not violated. Thank you, Norlene, appreciate it. Commissionership. Your turn. Very good. I'm just going to say, uh, and this is the way I grew up. I grew up during the turbulent times of the 60s. I was the youngest out of seven children uh, to my mother and father and um, grew up in a public housing project. So I grew up during a period of activism. And activism works. No, no. In uh, Eric Paul Potter's cross. And activism works. Um, you have to be involved in the process. And if you're not, I tell people all the time, if you're not at the table, you're probably going to be on the menu. All right. And let me just say also that we know about the social, economic, political, and the racial aspects 
to the whole criminal justice system, starting at the point of arrest. All right, we have a lot of discretion on who we can arrest, who we can take home, who we can get to uh, the services that they need and all of those type of things. And we talk about that a lot, but I find that we in our community, we are very reactive. You know, after someone is killed or someone is arrested, you know, then we start to agitate. We have to be ahead of the curve. And by that, I mean, even in the selection of your police officers for your respective towns, you know, the police department doesn't have this autonomy to pick who they want to pick. All right. It's up to the individuals in that town to determine working with the mayor and the council on who their chief of police or police director is going to be. All right. And they become the hiring authority and they determine who comes on the respective different police departments. All right. Through their process. There's two different processes, one on civil service and the other one is called under Title 40, which is known as a chief's desk. So there's some variations, but at the end of the day, as a hiring officer, you have to justify, of course, if you uh, don't pick someone. The police and the prosecutor's office, the prosecutor's office, at the local police and the prosecutor's office have a incestuous relationship. What do I mean by that? Is that they depend on each other to make their cases. Now, I know some great prosecutors, all right? But don't be naive. Uh, that's the minority, all right, in my opinion, all right? Um, there are some great investigators, some honest, and some, some very uh, good, actually, one of them right here uh, from uh, uh, Essex County Prosecutor's Office. But you can be in Essex County and be picked up on a particular uh, crime totally different outcome than if you're in Huntington County. Just recently in Huntington County, they were prosecuting a young man, one was 17, the other was 18, for having a toy gun. They charged him with possession. Now, his mother has to go out, first of all, get about $15,000 for a retainer, which he doesn't have, all right? In the meantime, now he goes through the system. So if he wants to go get a job later on in life, now he's got to explain why he had that on his record, even if hopefully he's exonerated. You know, it's such a bizarre case, um, but we have to be very active. They're passing laws every day in the state of New Jersey. We brought all of the pressure to bear to make sure they had an independent prosecutor's bill in the state of New Jersey. What does that mean? That means if there's a law enforcement encounter and the actual individual involved in that counter winds up dead or subsequently is dead, even if they're in custody, that case now has to be reviewed or taken control of by the attorney general's office. It used to say they may, the attorney general always had the authority to do that in the state of New Jersey, but now it says you shall. That came about by advocacy. Groups like mine, Noble, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, NAACP, other uh, civic minded people, we went down to the speaker's office, the speaker of the assembly's office, because he didn't want to post a bill. All right. We mandated, we made sure that he posted that bill. So we have to leverage the power that we have. All of us in this room has power. And, you know, I, I know we don't have that much more time, but I, I can't uh, a, a implore enough that, you know, we have to, we have to be involved in the process, you know, and like Shirley Chisholm said, she said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. You have to demand, you have to demand your rights, your God-given rights. And I end with this. In 1965, right here in Newark, they had a young boy who was playing in the street. We all played in the street. We didn't have nowhere else to play. And you couldn't go too much further than your step when I was growing up. Your parents say, don't leave that step. So we play in the street right in front of the house. And he, unfortunately, he was hit by a car, struck by a vehicle, and he was killed in an accident. And they went down to City Hall. They tried to pressure uh, the city government to put up a traffic light at that intersection. Didn't happen, all right? They continued to pressure and subsequently eventually got a stop sign at that intersection. They continued to pressure, continued to pressure. I mean, they were given all kinds of stories. Uh, we need a survey, which is true. We need the state to approve it, which is true, all right? But that process, never they never even entered into that process, but they were telling the folks, Fortunately, enough people stayed on the issue and they subsequently got a traffic light there. So things just don't happen. 
we're going to have to make them happen. And it's only through activism that you'll see different results. And, and that's so important that yeah. people be engaged in the process. And one person can't do it by themselves. Sometimes you can. Correct. When people are annoyed by you and they still get it, get you out of their hair. But for the most part, we have to be engaged. And I know one of the things I'm really about is civics because I know they took it out of school for a purpose to make sure people didn't know how to make government accountable. So that's one thing too. And you can go to the internet now. You don't have to have a class. You can go get a podcast on a podcast on civics, Mr. Thomas. I just wanted to say that. All right, you're gonna wrap it up, Mr. I will Pennington. Wrap it up. <clears throat> you know, I appreciate everything that everyone has said, but the commissioner just mentioned makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> There's strength and unity, and people do have to work as a group to, you know, force uh, change, but also on an individual level. Like I said earlier, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And what I have to say individually to the actual, you know, suspects and defendants and things like that, I'll tell them the same thing that I told the mother of a young man who kept on getting in trouble and kept coming to see me. So eventually she says, please tell me, tell me, what can my son do to avoid all this? What Lee just blurted out what was on my mind. I said, tell him to quit breaking the law. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. So we as family members, as parents, as members of the community need to impress that upon these kids too. It's not a game, it's not a joke. Quit breaking the law. But if you do, okay, fine. Um, try, you know, instill responsibility and teach them to be in the right place at the right time, as I said earlier. Be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do. I'm not gonna say it's gonna guarantee you uh, that you'll never get arrested, but it will lessen the chances of you getting arrested. There's no doubt about that. And then if you are arrested, remember the police officers, they're human beings. They have good days, they have bad days. They have good police officers, they have bad police officers. Don't say insulting things. Don't irritate them and don't aggravate them. Don't tell them I have my rights because you know what? You want up them, they'll want up you. Guess what too? They got a gun and a badge and a pen to write complaints and summonses. So be respectful, give them your basic information. However, as I said, or also, once they actually start questioning you about the event, that you're being charged with or accused of, you have the right to remain silent. Do not talk about the charges at all. You have the right to be represented by counsel. Wait until you have a lawyer sitting there next to you. They're supposed to cease questioning you at that point. They continue questioning you about, that's where I come in and I get that suppressed in a motion we talked about earlier. Um, so be respectful, remain silent. And again, I said where I come in, I can't come in unless somebody comes and gets me. You gotta retain a lawyer. Don't sit around and wonder and wait, or I'll go and see what happened in court first. And then if I need a lawyer, then I'll call someone. Sometimes by the time you wait around and call me, it may be a little bit too late. So as soon as you can, get good legal counsel. All right, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. I, I'm so happy to have you guys, you know, just to come out and do this for free. <laughs> So, yes, wow, can. That's not what Christina says. <laughs> hey, <laughs> as a prosecutor, I can't take any payment. So, yes. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to say, you know, Mr. Pennington, Mr. Thomas, Commissioner Ship, Narlene Cashmere, I'm going to give them all around a hand again. Oh, and I hope. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope the people in Facebook land really appreciate this. And I, I know it'll be available on the um, North Public Library website and also the images, the one of the police station, which was really helpful, Mr. Ship, to go through that. That was really helpful. The other one with the flow chart, that they'll be available for the public to be able to re reference the other points. So, you know, I want to thank all of you for coming out. So give yourselves a hand. I, I know it didn't hurt that it was hot outside and it's air conditioned in here. <laughs> So I so appreciate it. We tied it up a little later than we wanted to. Don't want to take advantage of people's time. So I so appreciate you all coming. I hope this was very helpful that you'll share the information with people in the public, particularly young people. So they'll have this information. So we, the whole idea is what can we do to keep people from having that same drama? And to the extent we have people willing to come out on their own time to give time to the public. You know, people don't even know what the word public means everything, anymore. They want everything is monetized, right? So this is just great to have this kind of information. Somebody. Oh.
Oh, good. Right. Oh, yeah, there's some questions. I didn't do that. I apologize. But Mr. Thomas, he was making sure. I just, just want sure. to say one thing very quickly, and then we'll go to questions, I guess. Thank uh, you. Uh, McDonald Carter. And now, the our website for Noble is noblenj.org. That's for the state website. And then we have a national website, noble, N-O-B-L-E, dot N-A-T-L, abbreviation for national. On that website, you can go to that website and you can connect with us anytime you want us to come out to any community, uh, civic association, any nonprofit, uh, sorority, fraternity, we will come out. We have a program called The Law and You. And it's basically geared towards young people between the ages of 13 to 18. And it basically educates them on what's their rights as well as what's their responsibilities if they interact with a law enforcement officer. So I wanted to make that available to you all. That's really helpful. And I did want to take a couple of questions. So who had Yes, you want to. What's your question? So you were actually giving us a recommendation. Well, I always tell people the best way to stay out of trouble is never get into it In from the, the beginning. Place. Right. Yeah. Ms. Montague, you had a question and this is back. Is he in federal? He's in state. That's right. That's a. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, thank you. Done, but that makes um, sense. <laughs> that's all I wanted to know. What determines the can? Like, what are the critical oh, the factors that early? determine? She's asking, you know, what happens at the 90 days if they don't pursue the indictment? Um, so, what happens um, after 90 days, the person is released. That's it. Um, that, that is what happened. Um, so, but there are things that, that happens between that that can toll the time. So if the defendant files a motion or makes an application to drug court, sometimes defendants don't wanna appear in court. Um, so that delays that delays the 90 days, but there's no other recourse but uh, for that defendant to be released. And that's a position um, uh, that prosecutors don't wanna be in, especially when, um, it is um, uh, the person is charged with a violent offense. Um, Ms. Bay. Thank you and so much, Bennett. Linda. And thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you to both of you inviting me. That's what happened. And it was very enlightening, I think, all of you tonight. But I was wondering if uh, the program that they had for years at, I think, Rawway, uh, scared straight program is yes. that still in existence no that's not that's not in existence i hadn't heard uh, they anything think it's, about they it i think it's too rough for young people now i was actually working out there at the time when they had it back in the early 80s and it, it was an effective program the only problem with that is after they did an analysis of it also is that you know that one shock factor it needs to be something that's more sustainable mm -hmm. that's going to stay with that person mm -hmm. but once they leave that experience they, you know, you may get a breakthrough with some, but overall, you know, needs well, to be just, something more sustainable. Just real quick about, it had to be about 15 years ago. I don't know how long it's been extinct, mm -hmm. but we took a group of us when we had our organization, we took our nephews and sons down to the prison mm -hmm. and we had planned the whole day. And mm -hmm. after they went through that whole piece of, you know, throwing them in the jail, you know, that, you know the whole thing, Yeah, we took them to dinner right it was 14 of our sons and, and nephews and only one and i my heart goes out to the one but you know actually went on and did crime and did crime. yes but that program was absolutely magnificent it really was and i really enjoyed all of it tonight can i just add no oh, i'm sorry Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, 
probably, I know everyone here probably votes, but we have to emphasize to people, even if it's for dog catcher, vote for the dog catcher. Because everyone who gets elected sets policy, just hires judges, appoints judges, votes for superior court judges. Anyone who has any political power should be vetted by us. And um, I know Commissioner Ship really uh, focused on that and saying, be involved. But if you're not even going to the poll to vote, you're really not involved. Um, so we, we have to emphasize to everybody that they don't just have to vote because people die for you to vote and people got, you know, dog sick on the vote. That's not the, that's not the whole point. The whole point is without a vote, we don't have a voice and we have to have a voice. E again, even if it's for dog catcher up to president, everybody has to be voted on. And, and as Ms. Pennington said too, know who and what you're voting for, because all of your skin folk ain't necessarily your kin folk if you know what I mean, all right? Because we have some people right here in this county, after we fought hard to make sure that body-worn cameras were in place, believe it or not, they got involved and rolled back all of the policies that we had put in place, so it weakened it now. So be, know who you're voting for. Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, I, hey, on, on the federal level, what's the no. difference between a magistrate and a judge? Sure. A United States District Court judge is nominated and appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, just like um, KBJ was. She was a district court judge. A magistrate judge, they are appointed by the district court judges uh, for a term of seven years. So they are, they're both federal judges. One is just appointed by, their, by district, uh, United States District Court judges and the other one is appointed by the president of the United States and confirmed uh, by the Senate. Uh, we have a question, Vicki. Absolutely not. Uh, in the only federal record that can be expunged is under these limited circumstances. You have to be under 21 at the time of the offense, and it has to be a misdemeanor. So that, that's, the only, that's the only thing. And if I could just add to a comment that she made with regards to taking those young men to scare straight and, and, and tying in with their, what I would suggest to the community. Uh, one of the things, I, and this may sound weird, one of the things that I would suggest is perhaps take a group of, I, I believe that every, whether it's freshman or sophomore uh, male should be taken to either West Point or the Naval Academy. Uh, I took my son there and, and you know, the, I, I mean, I, I can't, eat the, it's, I, I wish, I, I felt that I was deprived in high school and had I known about West Point, I grew up in Jersey City, went to Steiner High School in, in, in Jersey City. Had I been exposed to the military academy, I probably would have gone. I, I mean, I had the intellect in high school and somehow in college, the intellect just escaped me and God knows what I was doing, but I'm here, right? So I, I think for, from a community perspective, if you could either contact West Point or contact the Naval Academy. I think they'll probably pay for the the bus or the the, the tour up there, and you'll be chaperoned by a captain. and And it, it's it's a very nice uh, place to go and very in, inspiring place for I believe uh, for young men. And Kim Deal said hi. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a question, for Charlotte, and then we're going to tie it up. I would just like for someone to speak on serving on the grand jury. I did it for 19 weeks and a regular jury. And what I find is that since it was in Essex County, the majority that were on the grand jury were white. We had so many black people giving excuses, excuses, excuses why they couldn't serve. And then a lot of the cases were black 
people. And so you, you know, and the first thing, you know, I don't have time, I don't have time. So you don't have time, you are part of the problem. And I was the foreman and that was one experience. If anybody knows me, I said what I had to say. Thank you. And I, I've been trying to serve, they just keep rejecting me. Sorry, <laughs> I try. And serving on a jury is, is fundamental. People, um, you know, last week or the week before we were celebrating the 4th of July, People have a hot dog and a hamburger and a beer, but they don't want to serve on jury duty. And that is really, that's in grandeur, so critical to your civic participation. So, what, oh, I think we have two more questions and we're going to. That I asked wasn't answered. He said something that was so important, Mr. Pendleton. He said the intervention, I love that ounce of intervention is worth a pound of. Oh, pre prevention is worth, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right, I yeah. love that. Thank you for that, because I'm sure. gonna copy that. <laughs> but um, what she Made said- Made myself. Yeah, what, what, what she said, um, the civics are, are not being taught. So the, 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 the kids are not getting that message in the school. They're not getting any messaging about any of this. So there's such a gap in terms of information that the young people are getting, and I just don't know what we could do. And I would like to know what we could do to change that. I would just say in terms of education process, going back to voting and the school board is fundamental because that determines who's going to, what the curriculum is going to be, who the individual is, is going to have the contract to pick up tampons. That determines who the book authors are going to be. Are we going to get books that are okay in Texas? <laughs> right? So the book company, uh, whether, or not, whether or not Mary Baraka's book is in the school system. There's some fundamental things should be in the school system. And it starts with voting at the school board level. And that's where most people don't turn out, but that has the most impact. In the Maasai tribe in Africa, they say, how are all the children when they greet? They don't say hello, hi. How are all the children? And if the children are not fine, our society's not fine. And if I may add, I don't know if you can hear me, if I may add, Yes, uh, Linda, so, um, if I may add to what you, um, to answer um, this, um, I'm sorry, ma'am, to answer your question, with this program, it's gonna be posted on the library's website. I would suggest maybe sharing it with, um, uh, if you have sons and or daughters, nieces, nephews, who can share it with their friends. And um, the, the timeline can be shared also. Um, it, it is in color. There are words, specific words um, that they will see that will hopefully pique their interests um, and they will go on or doing their own research and sharing what they learn with um, their friends. So that's, that's one way of um, passing on the knowledge to you. Get it on the social media. Exactly, exactly. I was going to ask about the um, probable cause hearing. They don't have that no, no more through the arraignment. You think it's the arraignment and probable cause no more, or just go to well, CJP? They are. I'm sorry, you ahead. I can't answer that question regarding the probable cause hearing. So um, I, I know that there was a question regarding probable cause. If someone doesn't speak on the microphone, I can't hear them. Um, I was saying, um, did you do, did the prosecutor do away with the uh, probable cause hearing at the initial arraignment? If a person, they had to request that or you just get away with it and it goes straight to the uh, judicial process? No, so the probable cause, there is a probable cause hearing at the time of the detention hearing, right? So if some, some, the person is arrested, they go to court for their, um, uh, for CJP. If the, the, if the prosecutor filed a motion to detain that person before arguing for the motion to detain, the prosecutor has to argue for probable cause. 
but probable cause is a very low standard um it is uh, uh it's a very uh, it is it, it is not the same as proving the person um guilty uh, beyond a reasonable doubt so but there is a probable cause hearing that is done and if um the, the that threshold is met then the pro the prosecutor argues for detention and again probable cause will be uh put at issue before the grand jury and um one thing that I mentioned, I mentioned the 90 days to indict, but if the indictment occurs too close to that 90 days, um, defense counsel can also move for a probable cause um, um, hearing. Um, many prosecutors probably would not be happy that I just said that because a lot of defense attorneys forget that again, they can argue for a probable cause hearing at that point. But if it's, uh, if it's um, within two weeks of the 90 days, um, there can be a probable cause hearing. <laughs> uh, I don't think I have a question. I have a comment more. It would lean on the more of a comment. First of all, the prosecutorial conduct and the stuff that you're saying with the 90 days, that is not always applicable to everyone. And I could, I could testify to that. My name is Mr. Kirby. The name of my book is I'm more than a state number at the doing time. My thing, my question to everyone is, how do you get our traumatized kids to buy into trusting a system again that they believe has constantly failed because of their parents, their grandparents? So we're talking about kids doing all these things, but they don't trust y'all. I'm being, I'm, I'm out here with the kids every day. Thank God I went through the system and came out, was able to turn it around and get them to listen. But I'm listening to the lack of respect, the um, other things that they're going through with the trauma, being traumatized. And when you talk about the 90 day thing, that is what case by case basis. And I can honestly say that after a person who did time in the system. So I know all the ins and outs of the prosecutory way that they move, and some people are misled by that. And I can honestly say this as a young man who's out here in the community trying to get the people to change, especially our youth, but our youth are traumatized. They're traumatized by their mothers and their fathers being in the prison system. So how did, and you say, the goal change the areas. You say change the areas in the location and take them to a naval base and, their, and all this other stuff. Where's the funds for this? There's no funds in this community for that. And what's going to get them to go to a neighbor base when all they see around them, you can't change your community of poverty, what you're living in as a kid. So you subject to when you come out the door, this is what I see. Either I'm going to be part of it or I'm going to be the victim. So how do we, how do we bridge that gap? When, the, when there was the lifeless group, I was there. So I know about the life group very well. How do we bridge the gap? We talk these things as adults who've been through it, but the kids, how do we get them to buy in to this is what you need to do? Like, okay, I'm not gonna call no lawyer when I need a lawyer because our community just don't have it. So what do we get? A public, as they say, pretender. That's what we label them. So how do we, so if we're going to be real and transparent, how do we get our youth to buy into the, all the prosecutors are not bad. All the police are not bad. Just like you said, and that's a fact. It's good and it's good and bad and everything. How do we get our youth, our traumatized youth to buy into this so we won't have so many meetings and things of how to deal with our youth? How do we get to the bottom and bridge that gap? That's what's needed, bridging the gap so they will trust again and believe that every officer is not a bad officer, every prosecutor is not here to send them away for the rest of their life, and now they're even more traumatized when they're in the system. So, I, so let, let, me, let, let me answer that question since he hinted to the fact that everybody can go to West Point or Naval Academy. I believe you walked in after the final question was asked as to what comments do we have with regards to the community. And you missed all of our response. The young lady here brought up the fact that she took 14 individuals to a prison 
And, and before she asked that question, she talked about, she directed a question to Commissioner Ship with regards to the scared, with regards to the scared straight pro, um, program. What I thought what she did was a phenomenal idea of taking the individuals that she mentored um, to a prison. As she said that, I hearken back to the fact after when I took my nine-year-old to West Point. And as I went through, and I'm talking about my own personal experience, as I walked through the campus of West Point, being guided by a African-American captain and watching white soldiers salute him throughout our walk, right? I felt as a black man being deprived in high school of knowing anything about West Point. And I learned about West Point in college. So what I suggested was that perhaps you all, one thing to do as a community outreach, and it was a suggestion, one thing to do as a community outreach is to contact West Point and see if they could sponsor a bus to bring kids up there. Who knows whether one would be inspired, but I'd rather you inspire one than to lose that particular one. So that's how you do it. You know, you reach one at a time. You, look, there's no global solution to anything that we have to do. And I think what you're looking for is a global solution. When you find that global solution, please contact me. I will leave my, leave my job. We could patent that and we could make millions of dollars. But there isn't any global solution to the problem that we face daily with regards to mass incarceration and the colorization of the criminal justice system. I was going to say that's for that's for a whole nother if, day. If, several... yeah, just, just very quickly, if <coughs> okay. I can say also too, uh, Brown, Brown uh, seventy six. It was a surge in violence in urban communities, and I would submit that that came about behind the fact that the economics from those communities left. You used to can manufacture any, everything, Newark, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Trenton. Matter of fact, Trenton used to have a sign, they still have to sign up, Trenton makes the world takes. Once they stripped those communities of all of those employment opportunities, crime rates went up. So it goes back to social economics. And we concentrate a lot on the, on the after versus in the, if, if, in the beginning, okay? So until we deal with the social economic structure that is in this country, we're gonna to continue to have crime because people are gonna eat. Now, if they gotta rob, steal, or kill to do it, you know, that's, it's gonna happen. You know, so what we have to do is make sure that when people are planning to develop these communities, make sure they have the infrastructure in place to be sustainable over periods of time. And we also have to look at our educational systems because I believe we deal with a system that's an indo indoctrination versus an educational system. And we're indoctrinated with the Eurocentric thinking versus the Amistad curriculum that's been put in place, but it's, not sti it's still not in school districts. You know, because once a person has knowledge of self, they will do better and know where they came from. And, and I would say that there's a lot of money here. The question is having the, 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 for us to have the power to force them to use the money. We know there are no activities after schools. I was a young man at Rikers and they asked him about the violence at Rikers. And he said, but there's nothing to do. I actually represented somebody who was trespassing on school property after 315. You want children on school property after 315. There should be activities for them afterwards. But as a country, we decided that they're not a priority. Ukraine is the priority, right? So it's a question of what our priorities are. And as a group, we're not gonna do it as, as um, Mr. Thomas said, it may not happen because we all have different fingerprints, even though we're all treated the same pretty much, right? All of us could be shot, shot at 90 times and it hit us 60 times, just because we have a certain color. But we have different fingerprints. So it makes it difficult to say it's gonna be a global solution. However, it doesn't mean you could do your part, you could do your part, one person added to another person, added to another person. But that is a, a, something we can address at another time. I appreciate the point. I gave you my card. We need to have a couple of hours and you pay for dinner. So again, I want to thank everybody. Um, you kind of close this up. That was really good. Your time was perfect. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, be safe going home. You know, that's interesting because we never said be safe. We said we'll see you later. So we'll see you later. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.